Okay, John 15, and let's pray. Father, we uh, thank you, Lord, that we can come before your throne. Father, through the shed blood of your Son, Lord, we can stand before you in your righteousness. Father, I ask you, Lord, that the, uh, the anointing that abides in us, Lord, that you would stir it, that it would teach us things, Father, concerning you and your Son. Father, that your Spirit would magnify your Son in our hearts, Lord, that we would know more of you, experience more of you. Father, even tonight, Lord, I ask you that you would release increased measures of light of the Holy Spirit on our hearts and on our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, tonight I want to talk about, it says on the notes, it says entering in the joy of the Father, but we're really supposed to be experiencing the joy of the Father. So that's what we're talking about tonight, experiencing the joy of the Father. You know, joy is a, can be a bit of an abstract uh, concept. There's lots of ideas about joy, and uh, but I think in the simplest way of defining joy is this deep sense of well-being. This deep sense of well-being. Now there are other facets of joy in terms of the pleasure dimension of joy that we experience in our heart, the, the strengthening dimensions of joy that we experience in our heart. Now there is the enjoyment component of joy, but, but fundamentally the, the, the issue of joy is that deep sense of well-being. As I was getting ready um, uh, for tonight, I just kept thinking about Isaiah 24. I don't have, the, I don't have that in the notes, but Isaiah 24, verses 8 to 11, one of the things that the prophet speaks of, he talks about the failure of joy in the earth. That because of the crisis, morally, economically, socially, militarily, politically, all the different crises that will emerge as the end of the age draws nigh, one of the things that we will see is a failure of joy in, uh, among the unbelieving community. And so it makes this, this, uh, this subject of the joy of the Lord or the joy of the Father, the sense of well-being absolutely um, important. Isaiah 24, uh, verses 8 to 11, we see the removal of joy from the earth, and then the increase of confusion among the nations. In fact, the confusion is so strong, it says, that, that even when uh, men and women would turn to substance abuse, that even the substance will prove itself absolutely powerless from the very beginning insofar as being able to numb the pain and the confusion of the soul. In other words, there will be no escaping from the pain and the confusion. And the, but the good news is, is that we have the joy of the Father that we can experience in the gospel, and that is really what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about experiencing the joy of the Father. I believe that the experiencing of his joy is one of the key elements of the grace of God. It's one of the key elements that empowers and invigorates the heart to stay steady in the face of pressure, to stay steady in the face of temptations, uh, and to, just to stay steady in terms of our walk with the Lord is this issue of joy as a very important element of the grace of God. And I will share a, a brief testimony about that a little later on. But John chapter 15, verse 9, Jesus, I believe, gives probably one of the most, if not the most important exhortation and commandment to his people. And that is that we are to abide in his love, that we are to dwell there, we are to live there. Uh, we are to, in other words, we are to interact with him in that place. We want to fill our hearts and our minds through the word with information about his love. We want to ask him about his love. We want to speak of his love. We want to express his love. But what is interesting is that the love that he calls us to abide in, the, the love that he calls us to interact with, he gives us a definition of that love. 
and it's in the first part of the verse. It is the, it is the love of the Father for the Son. That's the love by which he loves us. That the exact same way that God loves God is the way that God loves us. And so it's an interesting definition, and, we'll, and again, we'll, we'll get back to that in just a few moments about why this is so important and why this is so critical for us as we grow in the things of the Lord. Now, paragraph A, a theological premise of, of the forerunner ministry is that the spirit, as things unfold, is going to bring a great focus to the end time revelation of the Father. Uh, there is a, there's great need, um, more than ever, of the understanding of God the Father. And it's absolutely amazing how much the New Testament focuses on this attribute of God. There are 13 hints towards uh, fatherly characteristics, so to speak, of the Father in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, uh, it gets highlighted over 300 times. That's how much it, uh, this theme of the Father dominates, really, Jesus' ministry as well as the ministry of the apostles. Paragraph B, one of Jesus' aims in John 13 to 17, which is the focus of this course, is to equip the hearts of his followers to grow in intimacy with the Father. That is, uh, uh, the, the, I believe, the primary aim of these five chapters is to equip his apostles right then and there, but really to equip us as believers to, to grow in intimacy, to grow in our relationship and knowing the truth of who the Father is. You know, I think of the woman at the well where Jesus says that the Father was seeking worshipers who would worship him in spirit and in truth. In other words, he is looking for worshipers or men and women or followers who would um, interact with him by the Spirit, through Holy Spirit interaction, number one, and that they would worship him or they would know him in truth. And, and again, there's a lot to be said about the truth. One, it's just the basic that we would worship him in accordance to the truth of, um, uh, according to the truth of the word, uh, the things that he says is true and so forth. But for tonight, I want to highlight that I, part of what he's talking about is that we will worship him according to the truth of who he is, that we would have a, a, a proper biblical understanding of who the Father is called the subject of the knowledge of God, that we would have right understanding of who the Father is, what he is like, what he thinks, what he feels, what he's up to, what, is, what his agenda is, and so forth. And so the Lord is, is equipping the church to interact with the Father, to grow in intimacy with him, so that we can, number one, confidently engage with the Father, confidently interact with the Father, number one. Number two, that we can have, that we can receive of the Father's leadership. And number three, that we would understand the glory of the Father as it pertains to what it is that he's up to. In terms of where is this whole thing called human history, this whole thing called the plan of redemption, where is it all going? And so John 13 to 17 is seeking to equip our hearts to then interact with the Father, to, to, conf to confidently interact with the number one, to receive of his leadership, and number three, to understand what it is that he's up to. It, it is the primary focus of Jesus' ministry. And in John 17, 26, the very last verse of these five chapters, Jesus makes a startling statement. He says, Father, I have declared to them your name. In other words, I've spoken to them about you, but then the next thing he says, he says, I will continue to talk to them about you. And so, so, so for 33 years, Jesus spoke about the Father, and after his death, burial, and resurrection by the Holy Spirit, he is going to continue to talk to us about the Father, and I believe that even in the ages to come, he's going to continue to talk to us about the Father. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6 tells us that we've been raised up all together, right, to be seated in heavenly places. And then verse 7, he says, so that in the ages to come, he may demonstrate to us 
the, the, uh, the extravagance of his kindness, the Father's kindness that is discovered in the person of Jesus Christ. And one of the things that we get to look forward to in the age to come is discovering how indescribably kind the Father is. It will absolutely blow our mind that he truly is and will be the kindest person that we will have ever met. And so, so Jesus in his ministry, he speaks to us about the Father. After his resurrection and ascension by the Spirit, he speaks to us about the Father. But I believe that in the ages to come, he will unfold to us, <laughs> I mean, just layers, I mean, glory upon glory upon glory upon glory about who the Father is. Because one of the most amazing things, I'm kind of get, getting a little bit ahead of myself, but because one of the amazing thing is, think about this, is that in eternity past, if we can even let our minds go there, but in eternity past, the Father and the Son were in deep interaction with, uh, uh, with one another. I mean, knowing each other intimately and with the Spirit. And somewhere in there, they came up with this plan and says, you know what? We got to make human beings and bring them into this discovery. It's absolutely amazing. And so the, the, the subject of the revelation of the Father, I believe, is Jesus' primary strategy uh, to equip the church into the first commandment. It's his primary, so we, we can't get away from, from it. There is no other strategy to, uh, uh, to connect our hearts to grow in the first commandment, to love him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And so Jesus says in John 17, 26, he says that I've declared to them your name. I will declare it for this reason, that the love with which you have loved me might be in them. Paragraph C, the, the understanding of the Father um, was climactic. In, in Paul's mind, in Paul's apostolic ministry. He, I believe that he saw the, uh, the end of all things being summed up in the embrace of the Father. Again, it was also foremost on Jesus' mind. But right there in the notes, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 28, there's a powerful passage talking about Jesus' leadership when he comes back to the earth and that how for a thousand years, now it doesn't say it about, it doesn't say there's for a thousand years, but you add a bunch of chapters and passages together, it comes down to the millennium, how during the millennium, Jesus will use the Father's authority to bring everything under Jesus' leadership. All of his enemies will be put under his feet. I mean, the, all the spheres of society, the environment, the economics, the politics, everything will bend its knee to the Son of God. But Paul says it doesn't end there. He says that after everything is under Jesus' leadership, then Jesus subjects himself and everything to the Father so that God would be all in all. Absolutely amazing that everything in all of the created order would be wrapped up in the loving and the kind embrace of the Father. A paragraph D, I have a bunch of verses there, and you can look at those in your own time, but these are verses in uh, John 13 to 17 where, where the Father is being highlighted. I mean, it's, it's, it's all over these five chapters. Jesus speaks so much about his Father, he speaks about the Father's love for the Son in John 13, 3. He talks about how Jesus is preparing uh, 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 access for us to be able to engage with the Father. Uh, later on, he talks about the fact that we can, and this, is, this was mind-boggling to the apostles, that we can have direct access to the Father. I mean, this is what's unheard of. I mean, up until this point, the only way that you could, you know, basically interact with God was, was through a priest or through a prophet. And Jesus comes on the scene and he says, you know what? He says, I've got good news for you. He says, I have come to make a way for you to, for you to directly engage with my father. It's, it's stunning. 
And, they, and he really blows her mind in chapter 16 when he says, he goes, guess what? He goes, the day will come where you won't even have to come to me to ask me to talk to him for you. He goes, you can talk to him yourself. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing that we would have the exact same access and the exact same relationship with the Father available to us as he has with his son. In that regard, there's no second-class citizens. And we are to interact with the Father's love for his son, Jesus says. Now, the thing that's amazing is that in John 15, verses uh, uh, 23, no, sorry, 15, 16, 15, uh, sorry, 15, 15, 16, 15, and 1625, excuse me, all these fives, uh, Jesus made it clear that what he declared to us is what the Father had declared to him. I mean, just think about this, all right? That the things that he communicates to us about the Father, about his plans, about his ways, are the things that the Father whispered to the Son in secret. Now, uh, we don't have time to get into this, but I just want to give you uh, three chapters just for your consideration. It's Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 to 14. Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 to 14 Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 26 to 28, for that matter, you can go all of Ezekiel chapter 1 for that matter, and then Revelation chapter 4 and 5. And what we see there is we see in these three chapters really a a glimpse of the, the eternal counsels of the Godhead, where we see this interaction between the Father and the Son. And it was in that place, and it is in that place where The father whispers things to his son. And those holy, those secret things, by the way, they're all found within the word of God. So let me just be clear about that. They're there. They are revealed in the scripture. These things are are therefore made plain. They are made known to us. I think of Deuteronomy uh, 28, 28, that the secret things belong to the Lord, but the things revealed, they belong to man. And there are things that God made known to us through the word of God that are available to us as means of us really entering into and experiencing the joy of the Lord. Paragraph E, Jesus' primary ministry aim, again, is to equip us to grow in the knowledge of God. And and the way that he did that was he was teaching us about the Father's desire for his people. He also did it by displaying the Father's power. One of the, when we're talking about the signs and wonders ministry, it is not just to be glamorous or to kind of excite our services a little bit. No, even the, the manifestation of, of power to, uh, to heal the sick, to uh, to, uh, to deliver the oppressed, to give sight to the blind and hearing to those who can't hear and, and even to bring supernatural provision as Jesus did with the multiplication of bread. All that was part of Jesus displaying the nature and the character and the concern and the power of his Father. And so Jesus uh, connected us with the Father's desire for his people. He, uh, he displayed the Father's power And he also uh, declared to us the Father's purpose. The Father's purpose. Now, what's interesting is back to Daniel chapter 7 again. I just want to highlight the verse again. It's in Daniel chapter 7, verses uh, 13 to 14. What we see there is that Jesus, the Son of Man, the Father gives him his, the vast divine empire is being given to the Son of God. All of the leadership, all the, the whole administration, all the resources, the whole kingdom is being given to the Son of God in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 to 14. But the thing that is staggering, I mean, just absolutely staggering about that chapter is how in verses 18, 21, 26, we find, we see the most unbelievable thing, and that is that the same kingdom that the Father gives to his Son, he wants to give that kingdom to his people. It, it's staggering. 
And what we see in Daniel 7, really, is we see the father's leadership in terms of how it is that he's leading the nations to bring the church, to bring the people of God into the very same inheritance that he gives to his son. Incidentally, in John chapter 3, verse 35, by the way, this is part of the love of God. There are, again, again, a little bit ahead of myself, but I got the verses in here. There are passages that actually define for us a little bit more, give us a bit more insight into what it means for the father to love the son. And so, yes, there is the, there is the emotional component to it where we feel the nature of God's love, but there are some real concepts that the father wants to unlock to help us understand what it means for him to love his son. We all know John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But in John 3.35, this is what it says. It says, because the father loved the son, he gave him everything. It's almost like the, the other side of the coin where for God so loved his son that he, for God, excuse me, for God so loved the world, he gave his son, John 3.16. But in John 3.35, for God so loved the son, he gave him the world. He gave him everything. Well, the apostle Paul comes on the scene and he really blows our minds in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and he looks at the cardinal Corinthians. He says, guys, he goes, you know what your problem is? They go, what is our problem? Tell us what our problem is. He says, you are completely disconnected from the fact that everything is yours. He says, everything is yours. You know, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago that the thing that's so amazing is, for instance, uh, you know, we know the story of Esther, you know, Esther and, and Xerxes, you know, the whole deal. And, and after he got all excited, and, you know, because he got a good dinner, he said to her, he says, you know what? He says, this is amazing. He goes, I will give you half my kingdom. It's like, wow, okay. Well, Daniel comes on the scene in Daniel chapter 5 and with, uh, with Belshazzar and that whole situation there. And and he says to him, he goes, man, he goes, you interpreted a writing of what? He goes, this is amazing. I'll give you up to third my kingdom. I mean, think about this. I mean, that is a lot of power, a lot of resources, a lot of everything. Jesus comes on the scene in Luke chapter 12, verse 35. He says, it is my father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Not half of it, not a third, not a quarter, all of it. Why? Because he loves us in the exact same way that he loves his son. That the same freedom, so to speak, of heart and generosity and openness of heart that he has towards his son, that everything is given to him, that is the exact same way that the father loves us, that all things are ours, that belong to us. It's, it's amazing. Paragraph F, the, uh, the law and the prophets they show us God's fatherly attributes, yet knowing God as Father and our privilege to have direct access to him was not known until the Son made him known. Uh, it was the beginning of the mystery revealed. Uh, we see seven, at least seven places, there's more, but at least... Uh, you know, I'm going to make you eight. I'm going to give you all eight. There are at least eight places where the apostle talks about this thing called the mystery. The first one is in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 16. 1 Timothy 3, 16. Great is the mystery of godliness, Paul says. The second one is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52. Paul says, I tell you a mystery. We won't all fall asleep, but we'll be changed with the twinkling of an eye. Talking about the resurrection. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 to 10, Paul talks about the mystery of his will, which is the, the, the bringing together of all things in heaven and all things on the earth under Jesus' leadership. That's Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 to 10. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9, Paul there talks about the fellowship of the mystery. It's a, and, and there he's talking about God's, the Father's plan to bring Jew and Gentile together as one new man. 
and, and, that, and that this new man will be filled with the fullness of God's power and glory. Then Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33, Paul talks about the great mystery, talking about the bride of Christ. Ephesians 5, 33. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, is another one where it's the mystery of Christ in you, the hope of glory, the, the indwelling of, of, of God's presence in the individual believer as well as the corporate people together being indwelled by the Spirit of God. Colossians 1, 27. Romans chapter 11, verse 25, is the, the, uh, the, the salvation of the Jewish people at the end of the age. Romans eleven twenty five, 25. But in Romans chapter 16, verses 24 to 27, Paul says that the gospel is according to this mystery that is kept secret. Now, what is this mystery? Well, the good news is, is that the mystery is really no longer a mystery. I'll say this again. The mystery is no longer a mystery because these verses that we just looked at actually tell us what the mystery is. So it's no longer a mystery. But the part I want to highlight is that the very foundation of the mystery, Jesus highlights in Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Because one of the things that when you look at these verses, they don't all say the same thing, but most of them, uh, many of them do. They'll say that there was a plan. Instead of mystery, they're saying there was a plan and that this plan was hidden in the heart of God, and it was kept from even the wisest of people. It was kept from the greatest of the prophets. Isaiah didn't get this plan. Jeremiah didn't get this plan. Ezekiel didn't get the plan. Even Moses, with all of his face-to-face -face encounters with the Lord, he did not have access to this plan. You know, sometimes I, I mean, I don't know if it happened like this, but every now and then I, I imagine, you know, Moses you know, coming back home, you know, from his quiet time, if that's what they called it back then, and, uh, and uh, he's a little frustrated. And imagine Sephora going, what's the matter? He's like, I don't know, he goes, he's keeping something from me. <laughs> you know, he's like, well, how do you know? He goes, well, I do have these face-to-face -face encounters, and I can tell he's holding back. He's not telling me something. Not, I mean, even, even Solomon was completely baffled. He did not have insight into this plan. Well, Jesus comes on the scene in Luke chapter 10, verses, uh, verse 20, and he is absolutely beside himself. It, it, says, it says that he rejoiced in the spirit, and he says, I thank you, Father, that you have hidden these things. And he's talking about this plan. He says, you've hidden these things from the wise and from the prudent, and you've made them known to whosoever. When he talks about the babes, he's talking about not the scholars. He says, you've made the secret known to the whosoever. You've made it known to the masses. All the scholars of his time, he says, uh, they, it wasn't just for them. He goes, this insight it's available to everybody. No one can strut as though they have got more insight than the next person because, Father, you had this thing locked up, and now in the fullness of time, you, here I am rejoicing, and I'm declaring it, Father, to everyone. It's absolutely amazing what's happening here, and the thing that happens is that Jesus says in verse 22, he says, all things that uh, that the Father has spoken to me, they have been delivered to me. In other words, I'm bringing something to you that has been whispered to my heart since before Genesis 1. If we could, if we have a clock, if we could reach way back to billions and billions and billions of years before Genesis 1, there was a conversation taking place between the Father and the Son and Jesus is saying, now is the time for me to declare the very beginnings of this mystery, the starting point of this mystery, and here it is. There's a father. <laughs> that was a secret. He says, no one knows that you are a father. I am the only one who's known this for billions and billions and billions of years. 
And now the fullness of time has come, Father, to now let them know who you are. It is staggering, absolutely staggering. Let's turn to page two. So what happens, you know, I don't know, I, I can't think of the time right now, maybe about a year or two before all this, something amazing happened, absolutely amazing. Because, to kind of backtrack for a second, you know, if you think about Revelation 4 and 5 and and though it is talking really about now Jesus in, in, uh, in the incarnation, but, but passages like Revelation 4 and 5 and Daniel chapter 7 and Ezekiel chapter 1, they, 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 you just get the sense that you're being brought into this forever conversation. You're being brought into this forever conversation between the Father and the Son. And what's amazing is that when Jesus comes on the scene, he's about to be baptized by John the Baptist, he gets baptized, and when he comes out of the water, there's this voice that thunders from heaven and says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And what's happening here? Well, there's at least two things going on. Number one is that in Exodus chapter 6 and Exodus chapter 9, excuse me, 6 and 19, God reveals himself openly to Israel after they were in slavery for 400 years. Israel's in slavery for 400 years, and the Lord reveals himself in a staggering way on Mount Sinai. In fact, the prophet Jeremiah says that it was Israel's betrothal. It was God coming to the Jewish people as a bridegroom, and when he does, a new era began, and it is the era of the new covenant excuse me, the era of the Old Covenant. The era of the Old Covenant begins at Mount Sinai after 400 years of them being in Egypt. Fast forward a couple thousand years. There's another period, many of you have heard it, it's, it's, it's called the 400 years of silence. So, so there's another time period of 400 years where, where God is not speaking, he's not bringing new revelation about himself. When God started speaking in Mount Sinai, now there were some encounters he was given before Mount Sinai, but after Mount Sinai, there was a series upon encounters on, uh, 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 upon encounters through the prophets of God showing Israel who he is. And I just came to a crashing halt for about 400 years. No new revelation about who God is. Jesus comes on the scene. He's baptized, and God does the most staggering thing. It, words fail to describe what must have been going on in that moment because God is about to tell the secret. We all know what it's like. You know, we, we got a secret, and I mean, it is killing us to not tell someone the secret. I mean, we're doing everything we can to not tell the secret. I'm talking about the good kinds. You know what I mean? We're like, we're just like, ah, I can't wait to tell the person about the surprise. And the anticipation begins to well up. It begins to build up. I can't, but, but, but the time has just got to be right to tell them about the surprise. Well, we're coming up to the time. And I don't know, I mean, because the Father and the Son, they were in deep fellowship with one another, but no one knew that there was a Father and a Son dynamic taking place. No one knew this. They didn't know this before Genesis 1. The Scripture tells us amazing things about this relationship between the Father and the Son. The, uh, Proverbs chapter 8 talks about how the, the Son was always rejoicing before the Father, I mean, it, it, was a, it is a relationship of deep joy and delight and enjoyment and transparency and, and openness and generosity and delight. I mean, he says, I was always rejoicing before him, uh, the, the son says in Proverbs chapter 8. So this is a deep, deep, deep intimate relationship. John chapter one, verse 18 says that Jesus was hidden in the bosom of the Father. I mean, talking about being near and dear to the Father's heart. 
that he was leaning, as it were, on the Father's breast heart all of eternity, knowing uh, every intimate thought and feeling and plan that the Father had. It's absolutely amazing. So Genesis 1 comes on the scene, and, and you know, and we don't know. Exodus comes on the scene. We still don't know. Numbers comes on the scene. Leviticus, Deuteronomy, we still don't know. Judges, the prophets, we still don't know. They're, they're having a ball, these two, so to speak. I mean, there were, no, I, I, mean, I mean it in the most holy way, this relationship between the Father and the Son. I mean, delighting in one another. Isaiah 42, you know, prophesying about the future. He says, behold my servant in whom is all my delight. All of the Father's joy and delight was in this, uh, uh, in the second person of the Trinity. And so the prophets, nothing. Isaiah, nothing. Jeremiah, nothing. I mean, and again, you know, I understand that God is timeless, but I'm imagining this divine anticipation building up on the inside, and Jesus comes on the scene. He gets baptized. He comes out, and boom! This is my son. I mean, this penned-up excitement just thunders from heaven, and he has to tell them who he is. And the first word that comes out of his mouth, he goes, I love him, and all my pleasure is in him. I can only imagine, I mean, what, what, what must Jesus have felt like when he heard that familiar voice? I mean, what did he feel when he heard that thundering from heaven, that very familiar voice, that, that relationship? He goes, Father, this, Father, this is amazing. Yes, 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 yes. I mean, this was, this was radical what happened. This introduction of the Son of God. The Father was making a very, very important statement in that moment. The Father speaks audibly about his love for his Son and his delight in his Son. He speaks audibly to Israel and establishes the primary thing that he wants us to know. He's establishing something. That's why he spoke audibly. He is establishing something that is absolutely critical. It becomes, in many ways, it becomes a cornerstone of our faith. And that is this, that you and I are invited into the fellowship between the Father and the Son. That this eternal relationship that existed between the two, that now, we have been invited into the fellowship, and beloved, that is the foundation, I believe, upon which John 15, 9 is built. When Jesus says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. He's building it upon that, that audible voice declaration, I love this man. Fully God. Fully man, I love him, and all my delight is in him, and I want everyone to know that about me. It, it is absolutely incredible. If you go down to paragraph F with me for a moment, we see that the, the interaction between the father and the son is a central component to the born-again experience. We have been called into, into it as we cultivate our relationship with God. It is the Father's desire to speak to us about the love and the delight for his Son. Here's what happens. As we meditate on, as we meditate and study and experience the, uh, God's love for his Son, there are, there are at least three things that happen. Number one, we grow, John 15, 9, in our understanding of how much Jesus loves us. We, beloved, we cannot grasp how much Jesus loves us without entering in how much the Father loves Jesus. Okay? Then, okay, so you go, okay, okay, good. But I want to know how much the Father then loves me. John 17, 23, he goes, you cannot know how much I love you until you understand how much I love my son. You're like, man, it keeps coming back to that. He goes, yes. Goes, okay. Because how much am I supposed to love your son? He goes, well, you don't know that until you enter into experiencing how much I love my son. And so, and so, this, so this audible voice declaration, beloved, it was foundational. It was critical 
And that's why he spoke it audibly. He was establishing something in Zion. A couple years ago, I uh, found myself uh, awake. I was, I was ready and off the night watch. I think it was about 2 o'clock in the morning or so. And uh, I'm in my living room, and I, I, I couldn't sleep. And so I'm just kind of sitting in my living room. And I was thinking about this, uh, this truth of the father loving the son, and therefore that's how much the son uh, loves us. And so I just kind of began to pray. And I prayed the, uh, uh, the simple prayer, you already know what the prayer is, it's the thank you, show me more. And I'm sitting in my living room, and I, and I, just, I just sat there. I said, you know what, I can't sleep, I'm just going to, I don't know, I'm just going to do something. And so I said, Father, I said, Father, thank you for loving your son. Show me more. Sitting there going, okay, Nothing. I say it again, Father, thank you for loving your son. Show me more. And all of a sudden, just the atmosphere around me just shifted. I went, ooh. I said, I really like the way this feels. I said, this is amazing. I said, Father, thank you for loving your son. Show me more. And man, just waves of his presence just began just going up and down my body. I said, this is amazing. I said one more time, I go, Father, thank you for loving your son. Show me more. And I don't want to exaggerate it, but it, it, was, it, was, it really was intense. I, I wish it would happen more. It doesn't. But it happened that time. And I was going, this is amazing. And I was just sitting there in my living room just, just enjoying, just feeling how much the father loves his son. And just getting lost in that. And I just kept, literally kept saying the same thing over and over and over again. I would wait a couple of minutes and say it again. And I would, and it just felt wonderful. And I'm just sitting there going, man, I go, Lord, this is amazing. Well, as I'm doing this, my, my, my phone goes off. And I looked and I, and I receive a text from a friend of mine who's been praying for my wife and I for almost 20 years. And they live out in Florida. And, uh, and he said, Stuart. I'm awake right now, and I am, actually, I went to the prayer room, and I'm just pacing back and forth, and all I keep saying is grace upon grace upon Stuart. Grace upon grace upon Stuart. Grace upon grace, and they just kept saying, I just kept declaring grace over you, and I'm sitting there going, this is amazing. But it wasn't just the point of that she was praying and the Lord was touching me, is that the Lord was saying something, was saying, son, this issue of my love for my son and you experiencing it, that is the grace of God. It empowers the heart. It strengthens the heart. It solidifies the heart. And again, you know, it's uh, such a simple prayer. I wish it was more complicated. Yeah, you know how it is, because if it's complicated, we can brag about how we accomplished it. Lord goes, nope. He goes, I'm, I'm making it dumb. I mean, it is insultingly simple. Father, thank you for loving your son. Show me. Yeah, because we always want to come up with some kind of reform we can write a book about. Okay, never mind. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so, and Lord goes, no. Nope. He goes, it is really that simple. And I want to encourage you, pray that prayer. Father, thank you for loving your son. Show me more. Father, thank you for loving your son. You know, show me more. Jesus, thank you that you love me the way you father. Show, I mean, I mean this, there are so many combinations of this whole thing. But I tell you what, the, but this whole thing about the father loving the son, because of that audible voice in Matthew 3, 17, I think it needs to be our go-to place to go to and ask the father to speak to us about it. Paragraph C, let's go back there. The father is the God of infinite pleasure who eternally loves his son. In Matthew 3.17, God thunders from heaven. The greatest secret of God's own eternal history and that there was, an, and, that there was and is an ongoing forever partnership in which God was and is forever mutually 
in the joyful and loving embrace of God himself. That's the secret. The God the Father and the Son, and yes, the Spirit. All three of them were there. The Father speak audibly, Jesus comes up out of water, and the Spirit comes resting on him like a dove. That there was this deep, mutual, joy-filled relationship of God being in the embrace of God. And God speaks audibly because he wants Israel to know, he wants us to know as his people that this is our primary inheritance. Paragraph E. Now, in John 15, for those of you who've been tracking, you, the, the primary fruit, not the only fruit, but the primary fruit of John 15 is the Father cultivating the fruit of true community, actually. The fruit of true community. The fruit is, the, and in John 15, he says, abide in me that you bear fruit. Then he says, abide in me that you can keep my commandments. And in verse 12, he says, and this is my commandment, that you love one another. The fruit of true Christian community. Well, what's the foundation of true Christian Christian community? It is the revelation of how much the Father loves the Son. If you can can follow this with me for a second, because it takes a little bit of work just to kind of get a head around a little bit. But John 15, 9, here's what Jesus says. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Say this again. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Let's backtrack. In John 13, verse 34 and 35, he says this. A new commandment I give to you, church, that you love one another as I have loved you. Okay? A new commandment he gives us. He says, I want you to live as one in community, and I want you to love each other in the exact same way that I have loved you, which, by the way, is the exact same way that my Father has loved me. And so even the starting point of Christian community, there's a lot of talk about community these days. Everyone's got something about community. Community, family, I mean, everyone is talking to it. The world is talking to it. The church is talking to it. But very, very few people are actually giving themselves to defining it the way that the New Testament defines it. And that the cornerstone of Christian community is, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you, therefore love one another in that way. So in 1 John, here's what John says. He says, that which we have seen, handled, and touched concerning the word of life. He says, we have declared it to you. Verse three, that you may have fellowship or community or be in relationship with us, John says. He continues and says, in our fellowship, he goes, our relationship is with the Father and with the Son. That is the cornerstone of our relationship, John says. He goes, we preach to you the gospel. We talk to you about Christ. We talk to you about his death, burial, and resurrection because we want you to have fellowship with us. We want you to enter into this communion, this community with us. And he goes, and by the way, this is our community. is with the Father and with the Son because through the born-again experience, one of the most glorious privileges that we have is we literally get to enter into that relationship between the Father and with the Son. It's, it's, it truly is unbelievable. But yet it's believable. In fact, that's the only way that we can access it is by believing it. And so thank you, Father. Show us more. <laughs> Help us. Right? Touch our hearts, touch our minds. 1 Corinthians 2 to 16, that these things are not discerned by the mind, but they're spiritually discerned because we have the mind of Christ, Paul says. We are called to participate in relationship and work of the Father and the Son. Say this again. We are called to participate in the relationship and the work 
of the Father and the Son and do it with fellow believers. And do it with fellow believers. Song of Solomon said, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth or his word. Talk about abiding in his word. For your love is better than wine. It's better than any pleasure that this world has to offer. Because of the fragrance of, the oint, of your good ointments, your name, the, the knowledge of you, the ointment poured forth. Verse 4, draw me after you. Draw me into that place of intimacy. And then he says, but and let, and we will run with you. In other words, I'm going to run with others in this partnership that we have in the gospel. Turn to page three. Uh, there are two books I'd like to recommend if you have not read them. Um, you don't have to, but they're totally recommendations, but they're excellent books. Uh, the f- uh, first one is called The Pleasures of God by John Piper. The Pleasures of God by John Piper. The tagline alone is delicious. God's delight in being God. If that doesn't make you feel Mufasa, there's something wrong with you. Okay. <laughs> But God's delight in being God, the pleasures of God by John Piper. Uh, Another one is called Delighting in the Trinity, Delighting in the Trinity by Michael Reeves. Highly recommend both those books. And so engaging the, the father's delight of his son, I believe that the key to joy, the key to the joy that we're called to walk in is entering into the joy or the experiencing the joy of the Father. Now, in Isaiah chapter 42, uh, verse 1, it says that, uh, Behold my servant in whom is all my delight. And uh, uh, many of the commentators uh, agree that when the Lord spoke, when the Father spoke at Jesus' baptism, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased, that it was uh, 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 partly fulfilling that prophecy of beholding the servant in whom is all his delight. Paragraph A, there's a quote from Jonathan Edwards. He says, part of God's fullness, which he communicates, is his happiness. That he is a glad God. He's a God filled with gladness. And beloved, if there's ever a time that where we want to connect with that reality. There there are many things that are in terms that are taking place in the heart of God, but the audible voice calls us specifically to enter into experiencing the relationship that he has with his son. And that is a relationship of infinite delight, pleasure, joy, gladness. Jonathan Edwards calls it happiness, That the fullness of God, which he communicates, is his happiness. He says this happiness consists in enjoying and rejoicing in himself. And that that is Trinitarian is applied there. That there's this enjoyment that the Father and the Son and the Spirit have forever. Again, beloved, there are many, many passages, old and new, that, that, that point to this and And the Holy Spirit wants to empower our hearts to interact with the Lord based upon these truths. King David, he was a man after God's own heart. And part of that means many things, but one of the things that it means is that he was one who searched out the the holy things of God, which I believe it includes God's emotions. He's the one who prophesied, Psalm 36, 8, that they are abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house, I believe the Father's house, and you gave them drink from the rivers of your pleasures. As David describes the heart of God, he describes it as a rushing river that is filled with delight, filled with pleasure. Psalm 46, it says, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, that from the very being of God flows a river that is filled with pleasure and is filled with delight, reflecting the very nature of his character. Psalm 16, verse 11, 
familiar passage. You will show me a path of life, and in your presence there's fullness of joy. And his presence is not just joy, there's fullness of joy. I mean, think about this. And even right now, as, you know, America and the nations of the earth don't know the left hand from the right. And God has some serious things to say about it, yes. But still at the very core, in the relationship with his son, there is fullness of joy and you and I, as sons and daughters, by the spirit of, of adoption, we have access to that joy even today. In his presence, he says, there's fullness of joy. And at his right hand, pleasures forevermore. I mean, think about this. I mean, who is seated at his right hand but the Son of God? That in his fellowship, there is abounding joy. And at his right hand, there are just unending release and manifestations of spiritual pleasures. The superior pleasures of the Gospels, as uh, John Piper calls it. In paragraph C, John's ministry, the apostle, uh, excuse me, John the Baptist, what is interesting is that his ministry ends with this thing. It ends with the declaration, behold the lamb. Jesus comes on the scene, behold the lamb, and it climaxes with the inbreaking of the Father's voice concerning his son's delight. Forerunners call us to turn to God's delight. It is incredibly powerful. It's absolutely incredible that one so powerful is eternally glad, happy, and filled with the light. It's one of the things that makes him so safe. So the worship team come up. Paragraph G. That Jesus invites us to spend eternity with a happy God when he says, enter into the joy of your master. And again, I believe that there are significant elements of that joy that we can experience even today in this age. Entering into the joy between the Father and the Son. Jesus lived and he died that this joy, God's joy, might be in us and that our joy may be filled. That's the thing that the Father offers us by the Spirit. He offers us his joy. It so happens to be that it's not joy in a vacuum. It's the joy that he has in relationship with his Son. So go look at paragraph H. That God's grace is to empower us to lift up our eyes and to lock in with this relationship. I believe that is part of what the Lord wants to do. He wants to, by his spirit, he wants to release grace in our hearts to lock in with that decree of Matthew 3.17. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased to give us grace, to strengthen us, to, 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 to engage with that relationship. We do it through the word. We, and I got several passages over there for you to look at, but it's, and there's a bunch more that I missed, but it's passages that just give us insight into how the father feels about the son. And all we got to do is sit in that rocking chair and just go, thank you, show me more. <laughs> That's all we have to do. Say it with faith, believe it, and say, Father, thank you. Show me more. And just let him touch you and let other passages come to mind and speak that back to him and take some time to write down some of the thoughts that just impressions that just may come to you as you're speaking these phrases to the Lord. I tell you what, over time, it just begins to shift. Something. I've said this before, I'm gonna say this again. It just bears repeating. Like everybody else, you know, you, we all get, you know, I get stuck in this, just these, where my emotions just get stuck. And I tell you what, if I decide by the strength of my own will uh, just to walk that out, it's a long week. But, and I don't want to exaggerate this, but I have, I have yet to pause 
and say this truth, Father. And, you know, because there's so much going on, you know, you don't know if you want to bind, lose, or and it's too much. I just go, Father, thank you for loving you so much. I mean, it's that simple. <laughs> I kid you not. And it's absolutely amazing how within a matter of, you know, 20, 10, 15, 30 minutes, there is a complete shift in my inner man. Beloved, it is that simple. It is that simple. And as we just give ourselves to these five to 10 second phrases, just even throughout the day, because we have our time with the Lord, but even just throughout the day, we can just, we can just whisper these phrases to the Lord. I tell you what, we do this for a year, two, three, four, five, you know, and so forth. It just begins to build a wealth of history in our hearts. There's a greater consistency of righteous emotions. His joy becomes ours. And as things unfold, the Isaiah 24, where joy gets removed from the earth, there will be a witness, a people, not out of vibrato, not because the music is too loud or we get to jump and shout and act silly, but no, but because we have encountered the joy that the Father has towards the Son by speaking simple phrases to Him. Amen? I invite you to stand.